Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The screen is in. I hope everybody has a good seat because there's still some seats um, empty here. So if somebody wants to hop in in front, that's okay. Yeah, better take the chance. You are early, so people are late. We'll have other seats. We always try to start in time, so that's what we should do. So again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Monique Knappen, and I am the director of the John Adams Institute, an institute that brings independently the best writers, thinkers, and public figures from the United States of America to the Netherlands. We're extremely pleased you are all here to see our guest of tonight, Mr. Tom Wolfe. In May 1994, Mr. Wolfe wrote us a handwritten letter. He was honored by the invitation to speak at the John Adams Institute series, but unfortunately, he could not make it. Now, more than 11 years later, he's here. So, we tried long. Mr. Wolfe told me earlier today it is his first visit to Amsterdam, the first visit to the Netherlands. And the fact that he's here today to meet his Dutch audience makes up, I think, all the waiting. Still, it was a close finish since Mr. Wolf was scheduled to be here last week. Um, but luckily, we could reschedule. Thanks to this venue, our staff, and you. I believe there was only one person last week, maybe I'm wrong, at the door. <laughs> the orders were all informed, and thank God we have internet and email, because otherwise we couldn't have done it. About the layout of tonight, Tracy Metz will be our moderator. Last week we had Ivonia scheduled, but due to the rescheduling, he could not make it anymore. He's in a theater somewhere in Holland with his new one-man show. Only last Tuesday, I could get a hold of Tracy. And if you are acquainted with the John Adams Institute, you know she's a familiar face at our evenings. She's not only an esteemed board member of the John Adams Institute, she's also a writer and a journalist for the NRC Handelsblatt. American by birth, but better in Dutch than me, but that's maybe because I'm from the southern part of Holland, Eindhoven, so can you expect? <laughs> anyway, I'm very pleased that thanks to her flexibility, we can all again enjoy her moderating skills. Before she will do so, she will first introduce more eloquently Mr. Wolf. After Tracy's introduction, the floor is to Mr. Wolf. I asked him to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes. After his talk, Tracy Metz will immediately, without a break, interview Mr. Wolf. And at um, the end of her interview, she will open up the floor to you too. We have two microphones to make yourself heard. At around 10 o'clock, we will close the evening. But before we'll do so, I will be back with some details to tell you how you can get your book signed by Mr. Wolf. Tracy, may I ask you to take the floor? There are not many men in my life, but Tom Wolfe is one of them. Without knowing it, he has accompanied me through many stages of my life. In 1968, he published the electric Kool-Aid acid test, when every one of my generation was experimenting with drugs, smoking dope, dropping acid. I, of course, only inhaled. Where have we heard that before? In 1970, he published Radical Chic. Like everyone else in the States, I had watched the race riots of the late 60s open-mouthed on television and saw how they shook the nation to the core. I could not have been more amazed to see black power move from the streets of Detroit and Watts in Los Angeles into the high-style living rooms of the wealthy and the powerful. From that moment on, even without knowing the actual word, I definitely knew the meaning of the word salonfähigkeit. As a matter of fact, this particular copy of Radical Chic has a special personal meaning for me as well. When I took it out of the bookcase to prepare this introduction, I saw that it was given to me in 1980, three months after I had started as a rookie reporter at the Dutch newspaper Het Parol by my then boss, 
and he wrote in it with appreciation and respect. I think Mr. Wolf will enjoy knowing, all these years later, that Radical Chic was the book that my boss then held up to me as an example of what our profession was capable of. And Tom Wolf was there again when I started writing about architecture, with his sardonic and irreverent take on modern day design in From Bauhaus to Our House. I have attempted to emulate his attitude of interested detachment, although I'm sorry to say that I'm not nearly as funny as he is. Tom Wolf was even there at a much earlier stage in my life with his book, The Right Stuff. It is about the hot fighter pilots, and later astronauts, who made their mark on post-war aviation and space travel from Edwards Air Force Base in California. I was born on Edwards Air Force Base. And my father was a member of the pilot support team. My dad told me a bit about his work there through the years, but it was from Tom Wolfe that I learned the real story. As you all no doubt know, Wolfe was the founder of New Journalism Capitals in the 60s, more or less by accident, if I've understood correctly. He got stuck in an ambitious story and ended up just typing out his notes in a 40-page stream-of-consciousness narrative, together with all the Wolfian tricks we've come to love, the italics, the theatrical asides, the exclamation marks. The magazine, Esquire, printed it pretty much as was, and new journalism was born. It took Wolf over 20 years to publish his first novel. Now we have Bonfire of the Vanities, followed by A Man in Full, and most recently by I Am Charlotte Simmons. These are novels. Well, at least that's what they're called. But novels are usually fiction. That means, I thought, that the writer made everything or almost everything up in his own imagination. But Tom Wolfe doesn't make much up. He still has the reporter's instinct for going out there to get his material, rather than closing the curtains and going in here to delve into the recesses of his own mind. Even in his novels, Tom Wolfe is, to my mind, still as much journalist and sociologist as novelist. In the past, he has called himself, himself a status theorist, which sounds like something we should definitely be teaching at our universities. He has certainly honed the study of status to a fine science. You just have to look at the way he himself dresses to know that. He will probably never admit it in public. Of course, I'm going to try later on. But he has a very ambivalent relationship to fiction, as do all journalists. He has criticized the contemporary American literary scene for not painting the broad panorama of American life. He still calls his novels realistic fiction, or a highly detailed realism based on reporting. So where, I wonder, does creative journalism stop and fiction begin? I have taken the Wolfian liberty of coining a new term for work of this kind, work which you will now understand is very close to my heart. That term is novelism. <laughs> this is a blurring of boundaries, and therefore of competences, which the literary world has not taken too kindly. As a friend of his said, I quote, Tom really likes to have fun, which is in very poor taste in the intellectual community. So, no matter what you call the genre, novelism or otherwise, Tom Wolfe has created characters that for a long time to come will continue to people America's and our literary landscape. He gave us Sherman McCoy, the self-styled master of the universe. I can see you all smiling. He gave us Charlotte Simmons. The, he gave us Charlie Croker, self-styled master of the plantation. He gave us Charlotte Simmons, the gifted goody two-shoes who turned college bimbo touting her belly button. What they have in common is that they are all on top or on their way up. And as readers, we stand by helplessly as they crash and burn. Wolf's heroes obviously have a talent for engineering their own downfall, while at the same time weaving us inextricably into their lives in the process. Wolf himself has compared the role of the novelist to that of the explorer, with himself in the role of, I quote, Cortés, reporting back from unknown territories. I hope he can tell us here, in here this evening, what it's like out there. I give you a man in full, Tom Wolfe.
Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy Metz. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about this term novelism. Is novelism um, as to the novel as spiritualism is to the spirit? I'm not uh, I'll have to, I'm going to have to work that out. For the time being, I'll accept it. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, uh, Monique. I, you know, it's been gnawing at me, Monique, for 11 years now. Um, when am I going to get to the John Adams house? Um, it's so beautiful. I should have made sure I was here earlier. Um, anyway, here, um, here I am, and I also want to, um, uh, to, to thank um, uh, Meyer Spiker, who has been kind enough to invite me to, to, uh, to Holland, and I want to thank all, one uh, and all. Well, now, whether it's novelism or what, uh, I have a feeling that almost every writer goes through the same uh, stages. I think there are very few young writers uh, who begin writing because they have anything whatsoever to say. Uh, people who become writers as, uh, as adults usually only write because they do have something. Uh, to say, and there's so many examples, and I really resent it. I mean, here's, we, we teach everybody how to write for, I bet everyone in this audience has spent 12 years, but more likely 16 to 20 years learning how to write. Um, they don't teach people how to choreograph in school. They don't teach people how to compose music. But everyone learns to write so that, that Grown writers can suddenly get to decide that they want to start writing, they can do it. Well, competition is, is tough in this world. Um, but I think the young writers almost always begin writing because they have a certain musical ability uh, with words that their classmates uh, don't have. Um, and as I say, they have, always, they have usually absolutely nothing uh, um, to say. But that is why there are, there have been so many great young poets um, throughout, uh, throughout history. Um, in the English language, I think of people uh, like um, Wordsworth and uh, Keats and Shelley and so forth. In, um, uh, in, in Holland, um, Wilhelm Tlose. As you know, God is in the depths of my thoughts. Um, and, and one I love most of all is Rambeau in France. Now, Rambeau was part of a group of young, um, of young poets, you know, Ferlaine and Baudelaire and um, Mallarmé. Uh, but Rambeau was voted in a kind of poll. This was an early poll of literary critics in France. Uh, he was voted, he was only 32 years old, and he was voted the greatest living French poet. So finally a newspaper reporter found him wherever he was and, uh, and said, you've been just voted the greatest living French poet. And his response was a classic. Uh, you know, writers are not supposed to admit that they read reviews or, or anything like that. Uh, his response was, merde pour la poésie. Um, I, that was great. Uh, the, uh, Arnold Bennett, the Englishman, was almost as good uh, when he was, uh, he, his first book um, the, uh, <clears throat> was a tremendous, a tremendous hit. And um, a lot of reviewers resented his early uh, success. He got a lot of bad reviews. And so <clears throat> he was asked about his reviews and he said, I don't read my reviews, I only measure them. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid everybody reads their reviews, but you should, if, you're going to, if you're going to write, you should remember those, those lines. You can't top uh, Rambo. Um, now that, um, being, a, you know, be, being a young poet was a, uh, was a quick way to, su to su success, right up to, I would say, almost the eve of the First World War. 
But since then, and this is simply a fashion, and maybe it shouldn't be this way, but the main arena, the big event uh, in writing this day and age uh, happens to be in prose, whether we're talking about fiction uh, or, uh, or nonfiction. I mean, yeah, there were poets who used to uh, make a lot of money. Uh, Lord Byron uh, made a fortune uh, with his poetry. Uh, Sir Walter Scott uh, also made a fortune from, from poetry. Uh, he made a little bit too much because he then bought a castle uh, in Scotland. And the contractors and the decorators saw him coming a mile away. And he got so far into debt trying to do this, redo this um, castle that he had to start doing something he considered very ignoble write novels. And his first 17 novels he published without his name on it. Um, the, if one novel was a uh, success, the next novel would be by the author of the last novel. Um, that would be the way it was, uh, uh, would be on, on, on the title page. Finally, there was a copyright suit, uh, and he had to defend his right to these books, and he had to reveal his name. And he felt really his life uh, insofar it was worth anything, was over. That he was reduced to this popular form, um, the novel. And it's really only in that you get to the late part of the 19th century that the novel becomes something uh, quite re uh, uh, not only respectable, uh, but then it begins to become uh, spiritual, uh, which is also bad, uh, because after all, a novel... Well, you know, the... the, the in the, in the uh, Hippocratic uh, Oath, uh, the, the young doctor is supposed to say, first, do no harm. Um, I'm trying to compose a Hippocratic Oath, maybe it should be a, an Aristophanic Oath for writers. Uh, and the oath should begin, first, entertain. Um, you know, entertain has a very simple um, definition. Uh, to entertain is to enable someone to pass the time pleasantly without physical effort. Um, and I think a writer owes that to everybody. You should be able to pass the time pleasantly uh, without, without physical effort. Uh, after that, you can reach for the stars. Uh, you can be the most brilliant uh, creator of literature ever. But first, for God's sake, entertain. Enable people to uh, pass the time pleasantly. But anyway, they were doing a lot of uh, they were doing a lot of, uh, of, of of entertaining people in the in um, in the novel by the late uh, 19th century. It was slowly gaining uh, uh, respectability. Uh, now Dickens was not really considered a great literary figure, even though he was buried in Westminster Abbey. Uh, he was considered more like a popular um, entertainer. Uh, like Bob Hope in the United States, uh, uh, or, uh, or there must be some uh, there must be some uh, some some French equivalents. Uh, just great nationally loved um, uh, and, and entertainers. Uh, then you only it's only when you get into the 20th century uh, that there began to be um, people writing about the novel as an instrument of truth. Um, and as a spiritual, uh, as, as, as a spiritual medium, actually they really mean a spiritualistic uh, medium. But that's a, uh, and well, I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll get to this particular problem uh, in, in, in a minute. Anyway, we 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 finally we we reach the point uh, where the novel becomes the number one uh, form in terms of status, in terms of its reputation. Uh, within the uh, literary world. Now, what happens to, today usually with the young writer um, who wants to make his name writing the novel? Well, when you start off, and I'm drawing on my own experience now, you really like to believe that great writing is 95% genius and 5% play. I mean, you have to write about something. But it doesn't really matter because you're such a genius, you can take... Uh, anything and make a great, uh, a great book out of it. And so for lack of anything else to, uh, 
uh, write about, the young novelist will cannibalize, the, say, the first 25 years of his life. And often this first novel is, is marvelous, is a, uh, a great book. But the writer doesn't realize he's used up his whole life material <laughs> writing it. Uh, as the American philosopher um, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every person in the world has a great autobiography to write. If only that person knows what is his own unique experience. But he did say everyone has two great autobiographies uh, to write. And that's what the young novelist uh, runs into. He's written this, this great first novel. He had, didn't make a whole lot of money, but he's been praised to the, the skies. He's a genius. The whole literary world is watching him. Uh, then it comes time for that second novel. And that second novel, if, uh, if the writer happened to live in New York, is about a, uh, a young man who has written a very successful first novel. Um, <laughs> And but unfortunately, he lives on the fifth floor of a five-story walk-up um, on the, on the, in the West 40s, which is not a good, not a good area um, in, in New York. And he's, he's lonely. He's had no, no luck at love. Frankly, this novel is really not terribly interesting. Um, in, the, in the 19th century, it was taken as a matter of course uh, that the writer went out of his own, outside of his own life uh, to, to get material for, for, for the novel. Uh, my two great gods of literature are Balzac and um, Zola. And of course, Zola went out like a reporter. He called himself a documenter. Uh, and he would go from one industry to um, another. Uh, he wrote a uh, La Bête Humaine is a novel with the, uh, uh, about the railroad industry, but he always had a horizontal plane of, of an industry or a particular milieu and a vertical line of the psychological struggle of the, of the characters. Um, and I think the results were absolutely beautiful. That's not always the word that comes to mind with Zola, but I, think, I consider him absolutely beautiful. Um, a beautiful writer. Uh, his remarkable book, La Terre, uh, which is about farm life, um, is, uh, is so great because of the work he did going out into the countryside, totally foreign uh, land to him, the, the agricultural neighborhoods, uh, and pulled together material uh, that enabled his imagination to play upon it. Now, I'll give you a better example than Leterre, though. Germinal, his novel about uh, the coal mines uh, in France. Now, I love this particular picture. Um, Zola pretended to be a secretary of a member of the French Assembly. And he went to the mines, uh, maintaining that he had been sent by the, uh, the member of the Assembly to do one of these routine uh, reports on mining conditions, this sort of thing. Um, so he went down into the mines, and this I particularly love, wearing a frock coat, uh, a, 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 a stiff stand-up collar, a cravat, and a stiff topper, you know, a silk topper with a, with a notebook. I like guys who go around like that. Anyway, <laughs> he, he, uh, and so he goes down 150 feet does anybody know about feet any longer? Well, there used to be this measurement. Uh, we still have it in the United States. Um, a foot is the length about the, the length of the adult male foot. It's, it's, it's very easy to remember. Um, and a, a yard, probably none of you have ever heard of a yard, but a yard was the distance from the end of your finger to the, your, the middle of your clavicle. Uh, that was pretty easy to remember, too. You could get a picture of what a yard, uh, a yard was, because that's all been replaced by meters. And today, when I read in the foreign press that a murderer is being sought, uh, and this man is 1.6 meters, what kind of a man is that? Uh, I don't get it. A 1.6 meter man? 
Oh, well, anyway. They, they, uh, don't forget, the United States went to the moon on inches. <laughs> yeah. I'll defend any cause that has no champion. Okay. Uh -huh. Anyway, I've gotten so far off the track. But, um, uh, anyway, the um, going out, going going outside of one's own um, life has rendered such dividends. And getting back to, to Zola now, he's 150 feet. That's 15 stories of a building. Uh, stories? Do they have stories still? Yeah, they, have, they still have stories. Uh, and he's down there with his dissident miners or his guides, uh, and he sees horses, um, big Percheron-type horses that are pulling sleds piled full of coal. So he says to one of the miners, how on earth do you get these horses in and out of here uh, every day? And they start laughing. And then they realize he's serious. And one of them says, Mr. Zola, these horses come down here once when they're still all barely larger than foals. They're brought down, lowered down here in nets. They never see daylight again. They go blind down here, pulling sleds full of coal. When they can't work anymore, they die down here, and they're buried down here. That's how the horses uh, live in these mines. And he doesn't have to explain a thing. You realize that you have just been given a symbol of the life of the miners themselves, who in effect at that age of at that period of history uh, were born really into the bottom of the mines. They could not depart that particular uh, livelihood. Uh, and they got, they stayed down there and got their lung, black lung disease until, uh, un, until they died. It's one of the great, to my way of thinking anyway, uh, symbols in all of literature and certainly in 19th century literature. And he would have, the point I really want to make is not that it's a, a nice detail or a colorful uh, little story, it's that his imagination would have never been able to reach that point with, had he not found um, this material. And you can only do it by getting outside of your own life and taking, uh, and taking a look. Um, Dickens did this routinely. Uh, to write Nicholas Nickleby, he posed as the father trying to park his son in one of these dreadful boarding schools in the west uh, of England just so he could get inside of one. Uh, and see the, uh, uh, the the conditions. He did this all through his uh, through his life. Now, this strikes me as very odd. When Dickens was not considered a great l figure in literature when he died, but seventy a hundred years after his death in 1970, he was by c consensus among literary people elevated up beside William Shakespeare as one of the two great. Uh, gods of British uh, literature. And yet, as far as I know, it never struck a single British writer. Maybe it would be a good thing to start off the way Dickens did, namely as a newspaper reporter and a court reporter taking down uh, shorthand uh, in, uh, in both Parliament and in the in criminal courts and every other sort of, of court. And as a reporter going around and just seeing all parts of life. That's how Dickens had this great ear for dialogue. No one had ever written dialogue so realistically, and it excited people to see actual, what the, the, the words of people on the streets reproduced on a page. It was exciting uh, to see that. But not a single British writer that I know of, who is of any stature, uh, has ever gone to work on a newspaper uh, in order to prepare for uh, a, a life as a uh, as a novelist. And you know the main reason is not that they can't make the connection. It's that it's so infra dignitatum to be a journalist. You know, a journalist is a beggar. I've been one f for so many years. Uh, you have a cup and you're begging people for information. Um, and you're at their mercy. You have to be on their schedules. 
And if they don't live a particularly nice life, then you have to not live a particularly nice life while you're, uh, while you're doing this. But someone who is properly brought up, brought up and gone to the proper schools, this is really uh, a humiliating spot uh, to, put yourself, uh, uh, to put yourself in. Uh, but I, my message tonight is uh, it's uh, invaluable if you want to write, particularly in an age... Uh, in an age like this. Now, there has been one, in speaking of American, United States literature, there's been only one great period of American literature. It started in 1893 with the publication of a book called Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, uh, by Stephen Crane. It ended in 1939 with the publication of The Grapes of Wrath, uh, by John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck became the fifth uh, American winner of the Nobel Prize for uh, Literature. Now, in that intervening in that period from 1893 to uh, uh, 1939, uh, you have writers like uh, Dreisler, Hemingway, uh, Sinclair Lewis, who was the United States' first Nobel Prize winner in, uh, in literature, Richard Wright, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Thomas Wolfe, my namesake from uh, North Carolina, James M. Kane, William Faulkner. Uh, it was, and all of these uh, writers, if I may borrow Tracy's term, went in for one form of novelism uh, or another. The secret to their success was going outside of their own lives as reporters. Steinbeck is a perfect example. Uh, Ste John Steinbeck had heard of these migrant labor camps in California during the Great Depression of the 1930s, and he had heard of the terrible conditions there. Uh, workers were working for uh, 12 and a half cents a day, and even in 1938, that really wasn't very good. Uh, that wasn't very good pay. Um, so he actually joined the staff of the San Francisco News and went out as a newspaper uh, reporter. He bought an old pie truck, as he described it, stocked up some provisions, and he just started touring these camps and, and just talking um, to people. Uh, and I consider his two main characters in that book, um, Ma Jode and Tom Jode, even though he was thinking of them as types, uh, to be among the most powerful figures in uh, all of American uh, literature in, in any case. And of the 16 to 20 um, major figures from that one great period of American literature, um, just about 65% of them, almost two-thirds, were newspaper reporters at one point. Uh, or another, and even those who weren't, like Sinclair Lewis, would go out as reporters to write a, uh, a novel about the Protestant clergy in the United States, which used to be very, uh, very powerful. Um, he would preach, by this time he was well known, but he would preach in the summers for ministers who were on vacation, uh, just to get a feel of what it was like to be in the pulpit uh, and talking to uh, um, and uh, an audience. When he wrote about his hometown, he didn't draw upon his old oaken bucket memories of childhood. He went back to his hometown with a bunch of five by eight cards. That's five inches by eight uh, inches. Um, uh, and just the kind of thing schoolboys have. And would, he took notes about that town from one end, um, one end to, the, uh, to the other. Now, a strange thing happened to American literature uh, just after the Second World War. Um, we became colonials of Europe again. It was marvelous. You know, here, the United States had established its, its own native literature through these powerful, realistic novels. And even Sartre you know, was so influenced uh, by John Dos Passos uh, that he, he very frankly imitated John Dos Passos in his uh, wartime trilogy. The Age of Reason, um, um, and the, the, these other two about the Second, about the second World uh, War. Best thing he ever wrote. Completely understandable. Um, 
Um, but you, you know, you take what you get from Sartre. Um, and uh, so that was the that was the influence of, of of these American figures. Well, right after the Second World War, uh, American critics and um, young writers decided that they were missing out on the great things that were being done in Europe. Uh, and in Europe, the new waves were, were movements like absurdism and magic realism or fabulism or minimalism. Uh, and American writers became very ismatic uh, because they were now coming out of so-called masters of fine arts programs uh, at the universities. They used to come from all sorts of backgrounds. Uh, if you, Hemingway, Faulkner, um, Steinbeck, Dreiser, put them all four of them together, you could not get one full year of college. You couldn't squeeze one full year of college out of the four of them. You know, a couple of them tried it for a few months. Um, but now they all have college degrees and they get their Masters of Fine Arts degrees. These are like uh, they're like hothouses, or they're like standing water. You know how mosquitoes reproduce in, sta in standing water? And w our novels now are just mosquitoes. Um, and, and they are written for a charming aristocracy. That was a phrase coined by a minor French poet, Catal Mendes, uh, in the 1880s. And he was speaking of Verlaine, these aforementioned uh, poets in Rambeau and Mallarmé and so on. And he was saying, great writers today no longer write for the public. We write for a charming aristocracy of, of people with superior taste. And so those are the people for whom these mosquito novels are written um, in, the, uh, in, in, in the United States. The charming uh, uh, aristocracy. Uh, as a result, it's only in the area of literature that in the United States we are such obedient little colonials of Europe. Uh, it happens, is spread into philosophy even. Uh, I'll tell you some very big names in philosophy in the United States. Jacques Derrida, uh, or Michel Foucault, uh, Paul de Man, um, and Today, if you go to Paris and you mention uh, uh, Foucault or Derrida, people will say, oh, I remember them, yeah. I, I, th I remember they were around. But in America, they are these great um, figures. I mean, totally, you almost totally forgotten about the French. <laughs> um, but they, they, become the, uh, they become the European uh, gods. I mean, think of all the things in which, in the United States, we've really done pretty well on our, on, on our own. We've done pretty well in business. Uh, I'm not going to get into politics at all, but, um, but we've done a lot, of outstanding, uh, a lot of outstanding things. Sciences, we've been not bad. Um, but now we've, we've reverted to colonialism. Uh, it's, such a sad thing to, uh, it's such a sad thing to see. Now, I had the, I think, I, I believe, uh, ad advantage of wandering into newspaper work um, when I was in college, I wanted to be a writer, and naturally I wanted to be a novelist. If you're going to be a writer, you're going to be a novelist. Um, and so I decided to do the closest thing to it. I mean, it was very hard to make a living writing, except on a, on a newspaper. And so I did. Now, the great value of newspapers to a writer is not... Some people say, well, you get a very concise writing style. It's horrible for your writing style. It's horrible for your sense of humor um, because you're always reaching for cheap jokes. Um, there's an expression in English uh, that's for the birds, meaning it's not very good. Um, now, anytime anyone starts an article that, that, that is about birds, uh, anywhere connected with birds, they say, uh, this was one for the birds. Um, this is really not very funny, you know? It's a... <laughs> Uh, so it's not good for your pro style, it's not good for your sense of humor, but it makes you see things. Um, it makes you see things in all areas of, uh, of life. On my first newspaper job, 
we caught, I was in a small town in western Massachusetts in New England in the U.S. Uh, we caught every sparrow that fell because so few did, you know, <laughs> where, where we were. And we would send a reporter like myself to um, a Sunday night church supper. And I went to one of these in which the Italian consul um, from the Italian consulate in Boston, Massachusetts, was speaking in Springfield. And I walked into this basement where the church supper was being held, and I could not believe what my eyes were seeing. On every table, there was a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and this was the church supper. And half the people there were roaring drunk. <laughs> um, by the t you should never try to talk to drunks. I mean, if you're ever brought to the, uh, a podium and have the chance to talk to a, even an enormous number of drunks, don't do it. Um, <laughs> They are not going to listen to you. They're going to talk to each other. And they're going to, at best, patiently wait for your lips to stop moving. Um, but anyway, they brought on the Italian consul. And he starts his speech. Well, sure enough, everybody in the room has <clears throat> a bottle of whiskey on the table. They start the conversation, bills and bills. At this point, the priest shoves the consul aside. Listen, you mugs. This man has come all the way from Boston, Massachusetts to talk to you losers. Now, and you're going to pay attention. You got it? Now, come right up, sir. Back. And it's a little humiliating for the speaker, you know, to, uh, to say, you know, if you can't ca capture these people's attention, I'm going to capture it, uh, I'm going to capture it for you. Well, now, there was no story in, in this unless I would... Uh, wanted to write a little piece of color about uh, drunks in the Third Ward, which they wouldn't have published anyhow. Um, but I suddenly realized not everybody in the United States lives the way I do. There are many different ways of, uh, there are many different ways of living. And I f frankly think that is the beginning of, that is the beginning of, of wisdom um, for a writer. And uh, as uh, Tracy was kind enough to uh, uh, mention, I wrote nonfiction practically all of my life. Um, are we looking at our clocks? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good peroration that I just gave. Um, I promised everybody that, you know, there are people who have to go home. Sometime. Oh, come on. You're like, <laughs> not yet. You didn't tell me that. But I promised you oh, oh. we're going to have a good interview. A good interview. All right. At stage. All right. Tracy prepared. Well, I hope everyone got the message. <laughs> I tried to... But there will be more. Okay. It's only 40 minutes. Okay. I'll tell you, let, um, let Tracy sit here. Yeah. You're very good, Mrs. No no novelism. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> Here, you sit over no, there. No, you sit over no, there, because no, no, you your, your left ear is better. No, but I can turn my left ear that way, and, it's, and it works out better. <laughs> Do I need to change my microphone? Okay. Uh, I can't believe it. I talked that long. <laughs> no, that's what happens when you speak from the heart. You know, you can't, <laughs> you can't stop. And we have a lot more to talk about. Yes. But first, I have a very pressing question, something that I've been wanting to ask you ever since um, uh, you came into my life, which was a long time ago. This is like the beginning of a song. Go ahead. How many suits do you have? <laughs> I, don't, I used to have a lot of suits. I'd say now I've got about 41, 42. Good heavens. Oh, that's not many. Because I, I tend, I'm, a, I'm partial towards white. I was aware of that. A, and to make people think you have one, if you're on a trip, that you have one white suit, you have to bring five. I'm not kidding. These are good for four or five, maybe five and a half hours. And then, they and then something terrible happens to them. And you, you've got to... <laughs> a glass of red wine. <laughs> doesn't even have to be that. I mean, Are they uh, custom tailored? I knew we were going to get down to the serious questions rapidly. Uh, uh, <laughs> And this is, you know, this is, this, is, this is where it's at. This is the stuff literature is made of. Yeah. Uh, we eventually may ascend as high as the Juggie Levain. 
but uh, <laughs> but for now we will we will don't worry I, they are they are custom made and uh, given what suits now cost in the um, anyway you've called is your this riveting this uh, <laughs> <close>? <laughs> you've called your style of dress in uh, in the past sartorial armor which I thought was lovely and counter bohemian you've dressed this way in this natty special mm. way since the 70s why well, <clears throat> I quote now Nathaniel West I don't know many people are we familiar. Keep, keep going back to the 19th century no 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 Nathan we're not talking about uh, not, this is Nathaniel West from the 1920s uh, when he went to um, Paris like so many American writers did in the 20s uh, uh, early 30s, the so-called lost generation. Uh, he wore a, he would wear these striped business suits, you know, unfinished worsted, uh, maybe finished worsted, with chalk stripes, pen stripes, and uh, silk neckties. He said, all the bohemian guises had been used up. And he said, people thought I was very, thought I was very unusual. Uh, and I feel the same way. I cannot stand these pictures of writers on the back of the book jacket with the wind blowing through their hair <laughs> and the shirt is always open uh, and you know they are obviously uh, they, are, they are obviously not falling for all this business stuff you know this uh, commercial world that they happen to be bound they happen nah. to be trapped in no we, um, want, wouldn't, we don't want to go there do we no I, I really think it's uh, I'll tell you another thing this is I personally, and this is just my reasoning, I th are we going to get off our clothes soon? Yeah. I think that, that um, men are foolish if after the age of 40 they do not take advantage of the tailoring arts. Um, <laughs> now, I will have shoulders for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thanks to... Um, and I won't have waddles who won't be able to see them because I have very high uh, <laughs> collars. Shall I save you from yourself now? <laughs> <laughs> well, on, <laughs> on a somewhat more serious note. No, don't get serious. Okay. okay. Well, there's, just kidding. I'm, just, I built just in kidding. gradations into this. In. Um, I believe it was 1998, you said in an interview in Vanity Fair, when A Man in Full was just coming out, you said, next time I'll be more realistic in scale. And in the preface to Charlotte Simmons, you thank your editor for walking you through the valley of the shadow of weary writing. Why are your books so long? Well, this is a, a question... They've, got, they've gotten fatter and fatter as the years have gone by. I think you've only gotten thinner. Mm. But my writing has only gotten better, and oh, well. I figured uh, And I assume people want as much of it as they can get. But, um, my wife has cautioned me that a man in full was weighed three pounds, and that I must write no more three pound novels. So the um, I am Charlotte Simmons, in case there's anyone here who hasn't read it, is who two, has or hasn't? Two, oh, wait, I'm using measures you won't understand. It's two pounds, 14 ounces. Does that make any sense? How many grams is that? I'm not sure. Um, well, it's, you know, strike that. Okay. Um, I also am told that by the professors that you will never maintain any sort of literary reputation through history uh, if your books are not short because they won't be assigned um, to students. How it's hard enough to get them to read short books. So that shows that I don't care about literary history. <laughs> <laughs> but the, as your books get longer, the plots get more complex and the uh, number of figures grows. You must, how do you do it, just practically speaking, containing all these figures and interweaving plots? Do you? Do you make a strict outline for yourself beforehand? Do you have a big storyboard full of post-its, or how do you do it? I am a, a compulsive outliner. I really am. Um, there are, as as was Zola, my my idol. Um, he would like to work out the entire story. An outline becomes a major part of writing uh, because you've worked out some of the most difficult things in an 
in an outline. Uh, Stendhal, though, would, was a marvelous writer who just liked to start with a character and possibly a theme and just let his mind begin wandering, like the red and the black. Um, but Zola, uh, Dickens was not an outliner. He, he, sort of, he would have an idea of what he was going to be uh, doing. But, you know, in some parts of Dickens, you realize that he wrote serially. He was writing serially. Uh, and actually, I wrote the Monfire of the Vanities serially against uh, two-week deadlines. I had a chapter every two weeks. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask you, how do I rhyme your compulsive outlining with the writing of a novel in, uh, as a feuilleton, as we call it? Well, that was a mistake the way I first, uh, I first did it. Um, Zola, who was absolutely a great serial writer, Oh, um, if you open a, if you open a, if if you open a novel by Zola, no matter what the language, and you count the number of pages in the first chapter, which might typically be 27 pages, you turn to page 54, and you're going to see it right there, the beginning of the third uh, chapter. He was just marvelous, and they're very, very well organized. But he would write about four out of. He usually, almost always, wrote 14 chapters. Um, they would be published monthly. Uh, and um, everyone the same, each cha every chapter the same length. Uh, also, often they were all they would be crowd scenes. Each chapter a crowd scene, which I think it takes great virtuosity uh, uh, to do. In the case of writing the Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, I had written three chapters ahead of time, so I'd always have a cushion. I wouldn't feel like I was just struggling to make the, the deadline. But the editor ran all three chapters in the first issue. Oh. Um, I said, what have you done? And he says, uh, he said, well, I thought we'd open with a big splash. Um, and so I was just out of breath, struggling every two weeks to get a, a chapter. That, it should be better organized than, uh, than that. And then in that case, when you, make, you, you get into a, a hole in chapter six, you realize if you'd only done this in chapter two, uh, it would have all worked out. But it's... It does get the book done. <laughs> that was my first novel. I have a feeling that I would have never completed it without deadlines. Where as, would journalists be without deadlines? Well, as my friend uh, William Buckley, I don't know how well known he is in Holland, but um, once said, thank God for the man who invented deadlines. Um, I'm not who that was, but... I read that you, uh, in 1973, you pronounced the novel dead. In 1988, you wrote your own first novel. That's true. What brought you to, to make this fundamental, well, Not nuanced my, switch? Well, I had written nonfiction um, all of my life. And finally, I'd written the right stuff. And for the first time in my writing career, I had a financial cushion uh, that would last me maybe a year, year and a half. And so I said, I'll either write a novel now, or another right one, and I really didn't want to reach the end of my career and look back and say, gee, I wonder what would have happened if I tried a novel. I also knew that there were people, see, I was touting the new journalism, as it was called, uh, which is literary nonfiction, uh, and I knew there were those who were behind their hands, and some of them were quite openly were saying, um, this is only a very complex form of writer's block. Uh, <laughs> you invent a new ism so that uh, you don't have to do the big one, the novel. So I said, well, all right, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the, uh, the novel. I only meant to do one, because I, I still believe that nonfiction is the most, at least in the United States, uh, is the most important, new, literary nonfiction, the most important new direction um, in, in literature in my country. Um, but that just because I was counting, it didn't mean that people uh, believe it. So I was only do the one, and but then the bonfire of the vanities seemed to do pretty well, and <laughs> temptation overcame me. Uh, and next thing I knew, I'd written three uh, novels. But I'm going to go back to nonfiction. Um, Did you? Unless my creditors start the owling. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with Charlotte Simmons being brought out in the first print run of 1.2 million, I don't think there's need to worry about that. Well, I. I didn't want people to run out. <laughs> uh -huh. 
it wasn't, I was wondering if you had turned to, to writing novels because you felt that this uh, fresh and frisky brand of journalism, the new journalism, had, had come to an end. Did, did the new journalism ever become a, a school? What kind of, um, has it led to any, any, any renewal of American journalism? Well, any time you name something uh, new, new That's it's dangerous. doomed. <laughs> um, like in the United States, the new conservatism is about four conservatisms ago. It was way back about 1912, I think. Um, so new, new is deadly. But I think the lessons of the, the, the new journalism, which was essentially the fact that you could write accurate journalism, accurate nonfiction, using the techniques of the novel, the short story, which are just four in number, scene by scene construction rather than a narrative, uh, historical narrative. You just move from one scene to the next scene to the next scene. Uh, the um, it, use of extended dialogue, which means that you have to do a lot of reporting to get the dialogue. The use of uh, status details, as I call them, the million and one ways that people rank themselves as opposed to others and, or judge others uh, by what they wear, what the decor of their homes uh, is, the way they treat servants, the way they, if, if any, uh, the way they treat uh, children. Um, there's actually also, as I try to show clearly in I Am Charlotte Simmons, matters of status play a huge part in the most intimate sexual acts, um, such as, what will the others think if I lead him on this far and then I don't give it up? It's a girl talking. Um, it's, anyway, that's, that's uh, another. And the other is point of view in the sense of writing each scene through the eyes of a particular uh, character. Now that takes an awful lot of work uh, if you're going to do it in non-fiction. It's very hard to pull that off accurately. And to has, me the accuracy is very important. Has new journalism given rise to um, a school? Well there was certainly a school at one time and but today I think young writers if they have um, are quite aware of the the way this has been done and they use it as they as they see fit. Um, there are, are a lot of wonderful um, nonfiction books done in this, using these techniques uh, um, today. Um, or oh, there was um, one, um, or oh, there have been several about American uh, business, in which you just this one scene after another scene, uh, particularly about the 1980s and um, investment banking, all that sort of thing. Um, it just isn't called that any longer. Also, there are not as many magazines who will indulge it as they used to be. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't the bookkeeping scandals of the late 90s be perfect material for uh, uh, a Bernie Ebers' Bonfire of the Vanities or a Kozlovsky or a, how many of these people have we seen uh, pass well, through court? Much of it is a new book about the Enron company debacle. Um, which is written pretty much in this manner. If I could think of the author's name, I'd mention it. Um, and there were others about the financial scandals of the 1980s that were quite good. Um, but you don't feel bar tempted yourself? Barbarians at the gate. Barbarians at the gate, the Biscop? Um, well, I mean, oh sure, I'm, I'm tempted. I don't, I've written so much about um, business scandals now, I don't think I'd go that route again. But, uh, um, we both touched briefly on the reactions of the, the literary world to your work. And now I'm, I'm not being facetious anymore. Does the literary world take you seriously? I don't know. I know they resent me. That, that's serious, isn't it? Do they resent your success? Uh, probably. Um, but they more, I think, resent the fact that I'm preaching um, a a f literary form based on reporting, on getting outside of your own life um, and seeing the world. I mean, the United States is this huge, bizarre country, and so little of it 
has been portrayed in fiction or non-fiction. Um, I, I frankly do not understand how any American writer can resist it, but they really know how to resist it by, by being, you know, obedient colonials, of, particularly France. Oh my God, the influence of France is just too much. Um, and, uh, and this really annoyed um, when A Man in Full came out. Uh, this so annoyed uh, Norman Mailer, John Updike, and John Irving. I don't know if any of those are writers who are read in other countries. But uh, We are not barbarians at the gate, Mr. <laughs> no. Wolf. Oh, that wouldn't establish you as barbarians at the gate, believe me. Um, all three of them went to the trouble of denouncing uh, this novel, particularly after it had been a huge critical success in all the um, early reviews and all the main media that you look to for book reviews. But this must have been very painful. You worked on this book for 11 years. But, but these, but think of this though, never in the history of American literature had three novelists attacked any one book, particularly three famous uh, novelists who are very old. I mean, you know, <laughs> They are my age, if not older. Uh, so is this a backhanded compliment, or how should I see this? Well, I took it as a kind of backhanded compliment, and I, I call them uh, my three stooges. Um, I don't know if the three stooges comic films are shown in Europe or not. Uh, you know, Curly Moe and Larry, and they're always hitting each other over the head with hammers and things. Um, so I call them my three stooges because literally a stooge, uh, it's a, show, a theatrical term, a stooge is a character who just feeds lines to the star of, of the show. And so here's Updike saying um, that his own work had been a victim recently of reading, he called it reader failure. He said readers reader don't- Reader failure. Yeah. <laughs> readers don't have the, uh, the sense of analogy and allegory that they once uh, had. They're not well enough read themselves. They just don't pick up things. And that instead what they read is the junk you find in the airport bookstores. Uh, and he said that's why they read Wolf. Um, because he's sitting there in the airport uh, bookstore and they're not, they're not reading him. He said whereas my piano teacher used to read work by great novelist. Um, I remember that The Grapes of Wrath was on her uh, bookshelf as I took my lessons. And that's a stooge feeding you a line. As I explained earlier, uh, how did Steinbeck write The Grapes of Wrath? He went out, he joined a newspaper, he went out to tour as a reporter all of these uh, migrant labor camps, went outside of his own life as I've been trying to preach into the wind for so long, um, and wrote this great book. And what was the last one that Updike had done? It was a book about a war between China and the United States in the year 2020, and how it had affected a small village north of Boston, Massachusetts. Now, somehow this is not a novel that connects with uh, <laughs> uh, much of anything. Uh, Norman Mailer had just done an autobiography of Jesus Christ. I'm not kidding. Um, um, it was called uh, uh, The Father According to the Son. Um, Sounds like a movie. Well, at, at its only chance was to have the red, be a movie with the Red Seas parting and uh, <laughs> chariots running across, but it wasn't that good, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. And uh, John Irving uh, the first two wrote these very, very long reviews. Um, I mean, for an old man to write a, a review six newspaper pages long. The New York Review of Books is like a newspaper. He wrote six pages. Um, I call that a waste of energy. I mean, at his age, you don't have that, many, that much energy left. <laughs> um, so that's a form of taking your work seriously. They have to take you seriously, if only because of, the, uh, because of your popular success, I should think. No, I think they, they have to take me seriously just because of the genius of the writing. That must but, be um, it. Um, 
Uh, no, I am convinced that I'm on the uh, that I'm on the right uh, uh, on the right path. I really am, uh, and I think as more and more novelists begin to see that they've got to um, move out into the world, the American novel has a chance of recovery. It now is suffering from anorexia. Mm -hmm. It's not getting food. It's is, not being fed. Is this because of what you mentioned earlier that? Um, uh, the U.S. have become a cultural colony of Europe. When did when did this happen? It and started. How? You can well. It started in about 1960, um, after a very influential critic named uh, Lionel Trilling of Columbia University had written an essay in which he said, "The age of the realistic novel is over um, because society is now unstable, and you can, you can no longer do a slice of life." and portray an entire society. He said, we've now come into the age of the novel of ideas. And lo and behold, he had one in his desk drawer. An idea. A, a novel of ideas, which was uh, published and duly praised and sank without a bubble, um, uh, never to be, never to be <laughs> seen, again, again. <laughs> seen again. Um, and to say that the age of the realistic novel is over, is like as if an engineer were to say, you know, I've had it with electricity. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been used ever since the 1860s. It's been done, done, done. Been there, done that. <laughs> Got the t-shirt. <laughs> so, you know, I'm starting off in a new direction. Oh. Um, so what got the colonization of uh, America by European culture? A lot of it was the fact that these uh, young people were going into these graduate programs. Uh, and you know, in the United States, practically all students are lived together on campuses. And it really can create a hothouse um, environment. I don't think in Europe there are that many universities where everybody lives right there around the, that's yeah. my impression anyway, lives right there around the, uh, on the campus of the university. Um, and it was very easy for this, these doctrines, these various isms, fabulism, minimalism, and so on, uh, to, uh, to catch hold. Mm -hmm. um, like an epidemic. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, mm -hmm. it really was, it has been like an epidemic. And now, and occasionally, somebody breaks loose, like uh, a, a young writer, Jonathan Franzen, who just wrote a book called Corrections, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is the best thing he ever wrote, because he, get, he, he um, moves into you know, new areas of, uh, of life. He was also very famous for getting not invite, uninvited to the Oprah Winfrey show. Oh, that was a very smart thing on his part. Uh, if the only, one of the few, success is hated, let's face it, um, by writers. Um, see, writers believe that there are two ways of success. One is to accomplish something, uh, and the other is to see others fail. Nietzsche used to call that uh, uh, resentiment, resentment, um, and he called people who live that way tarantulas. <laughs> well, most writers are tarantulas, probably in every, in, in, in every, uh, in every country, um, and they really like to see, uh, they like to see people fail. Mm -hmm. You've always been a, a, a trend spotter. You've always had a finger on America's deepest pulse. Mm -hmm. So why is it that in your newest book, I'm Charlotte Simmons, there's no reference at all to the traumatic events of our age, 9-11 and the war in Iraq? That's nothing compared to what's going on in American universities right now. How am I kidding? Um, you cannot be serious. I am serious. In our universities, may I just quickly go back to Nietzsche? It's after 8 o'clock, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, Nietzsche's over the yard arm by now. Uh, anyway, um, at the time Nietzsche said God is dead. Uh, that was back in the 1880s. He wrote several essays in which he said God is dead, by which he meant educated people no longer believe in God. At the same time he made, he said, before you atheists run up your banners of triumph, uh, I'm going to sketch for you the histories of the 20th and the 21st century. Uh, this is the 1880s, a peaceful time in Europe. Um, and he said, in the 20th century, there are going to be wars, 
catastrophic beyond all imagining, wars such as have never been waged before. And he said, why? Because man no longer believes that he's the child of God. Man believes that he is a, 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 a kindred of the apes. This was a nod towards Darwinism. Uh, that he's really essentially no different from a beast of the field or, or uh, a gorilla in the, um, in the jungle. He's not a very noble creature. Uh, so how can you believe in morality? How can you believe in any absolute um, truth? And therefore, he will, man, will put the faith he formerly put in God into, this was his phrase, barbaric nationalistic brotherhoods. Um, now here's a man who, from in 1880s, predicted World War I, World War II, Nazism, and Communism. Now, whatever you think of Nietzsche, I say that is a, as a prognosticator, that's a record that you cannot ignore. So, what has he written for our century? He says, in the 21st century will, become, will come a development more fearsome than the world wars of the 20th century. He didn't call the world wars, wars, these catastrophic wars. Uh, he said that will be the total eclipse of all values. Uh, and I'm not a pessimist by nature, but you know, that is beginning. It is beginning to happen, and I Am Charlotte Simmons is about the demoralization of sex. And very rapidly in the United States, which has always been considered in Europe a very uh, Puritan, um, uh, prudish, prudish uh, society, sex is being demoralized. It no longer has a moral component. There's only one sex, se only one form of sexual activity that now has a moralistic overtone, has, is considered immoral. There's only one. That's pedophilia. Anything else is Part of the freedom that men and women uh, uh, should have is, 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 I don't know if in Holland anyone has followed the story of Paris Hilton. <laughs> I mean, is, she, is that name known here? Here's Paris Hilton uh, today. Uh, she was always called the hotel heiress. Well, she's made so much money on her own. Uh, she has a line of perfumes, a line of clothes. She has a $10 million contract for a reality television show and a line of handbags. I know what it is about handbags. Um, every time a young woman makes headlines in the United States because of her sexual conduct, she issues handbags. Monica Lewinsky, <laughs> the first thing she did <laughs> was to put out a line of handbags. I don't understand, I don't understand women's handbags. Um, um, anyway. All right. how, did, how did Paris Hilton um, become so successful? It was because she made a pornographic tape of herself with a, a man named Rick something. Um, and somehow this got on the internet. It was shown all over the, on computer screens all over the United States. And because of this pornographic tape, she became a national celebrity uh, and is able to issue, uh, sell these clothes, get these $10 million television contracts, and sell, uh, and, and, and sell handbags. Now that is, uh, that is the demoralization of sex. It's taking the moral component out of sexual activity. And just think of religious morality, how much of it um, has been sexual in nature. And was everybody stupid in the past millennia that they put this emphasis on, on sex? You know, it's possible they weren't stupid. Maybe they knew something that we have forgotten. I'm not here to preach uh, uh, morality, but I am here to um, lay out the evidence as I try to do in I Am Charlotte Simmons. And I think the total eclipse of all values is more significant than the war in Iraq, if you want to know the truth. Um, I was just going to ask you, do you, do you, are the moral issues of terrorism and the war in Iraq less overriding in their implications for our times and our future than the demoralization of sex? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, the, to, to have an entire 
change in the way he, the human creature looks at itself, that's an enormous, uh, that's an enormous change. And, and, and sexual activity is one thing, but let's suppose it gets into everything, this eclipse of values, uh, and you find that there is really, there is no way to have a standard of ethics. If, if there's no God, um, it's impossible to believe in ethics. This is one of Nietzsche's doctrines. I think he was right. Um, if you do not, uh, people have tried to create civil religions. Sidney Hook, an American philosopher, tried to do that. Um, there's no basis for your ethic, ethical uh, rules to be obeyed. Because you immediately say, okay, he's using these rules for his own good. Uh, or maybe the nation is using these rules to keep the people pacified. Um, whereas if you believed, as you know, practically the whole world did, either, either believed in God or made a pretty good show of looking like they believed uh, um, in God, um, they felt that these standards came from the Godhead. You know, they used to be, people used to use the word immanent. They don't use it anymore. I double M A N E N T uh, referred to the fact that you know God was eminent. God is in me. God is at the apex of my soul, and they believed it. And when if, when you believe that way, you can believe in um, absolute ethical standards. But uh, Nietzsche warned. He says, unless you believe in a God that has a very long forefinger and can point at you and say, "Thou shalt," or "Thou shalt not." Um, then you can't, uh, if you don't believe in that creature, then you, you can't have an absolute uh, uh, set, of, set of values. And he said, this will torment people. How would you, as um, a man of conservative leanings, if I may put it that way? Well, people always call me a conservative, but, and I say, okay, what's my agenda? <laughs> no one's ever told me what my agenda is. You know best. I don't have one. How would you characterize America under Bush? America is a wonderful country. But now, uh, and whether it's under Bush or anybody else, um, that's just my leaning. America is a wonderful country. It's a very free country. Um, it's the only country in the world I know of in which people from a foreign land who speak a different language have a totally different culture and in many cases are a different color from the native stock, can take over an entire metropolitan area politically in one half of a generation. And that's the Cubans in Miami. The Cubans, refugees from Cuba, politically control uh, Miami and everyone get, is getting along swimmingly. I don't think that could happen anywhere else on the face of the earth. I don't think, why am I sitting here defending the United States? Uh, I don't think there's a, uh, I don't think there's another country in the world that could have a general in the army uh, who is of a, not of native stock, and particularly not of the color of the native stock of that country. And we just had a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that's the highest military figure in the United States, uh, who's the uh, son of bl black Jamaican immigrants who were garment workers. I'm talking about Colin Powell. Um, that's, so I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't worry about the United States on that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I'm not a political writer. I never, I, I find the United States so stable that to write about politics is really boring. Uh, I always avoided it when I worked on, on newspapers. Uh, does anybody here remember Richard Nixon? <laughs> um, when Richard Nixon... If people would like to move to the microphones, oh, we have time oh, sorry, for a well, couple questions. Am I yes, going on continue. again? No, uh, please continue, yeah. but people need to... Well, I just very quickly on Nixon. When, uh, when Richard Nixon was essentially thrown out of office in the Watergate scandal, um, did the army rise up? Did the junta reveal its actual makeup uh, and try to take over the government? Uh, were there riots? Did the Republican Party riot? Uh, all right, was there one drunk Republican who threw a brick through a, a bar window? No. Everyone leaned back and watched it on television. Oh, look, that's really interesting. 
Look, now he's flying in the helicopter for the last time. And he's going like this. That's what he did. Um, now that's a stable, <laughs> that's a stable country. So I, I mean, I, did, I can't tell you, I, I have to say I'm not a political writer and I can't tell you uh, about the influence of this politician or that. Uh, but it's really a, a stable country. The government of the United States is on railroad tracks. And people on the left yell at the train and people on the right yell at the train. But the tr train can't change course. It's on tracks. And uh, believe me, you can, you may, I mean, maybe people don't like the train <laughs> particularly, but uh, it, it's not going to be unstable, I can tell you. <laughs> Before I put my last question to you, yeah. I'd like to give the floor to our audience. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, Mr. Wolf, I, I have a question. Uh, you said the writers, especially young writers, should go out there to the real life to get the materials for their novels. And I came from China originally, so I always try to you know when you're talking, I'm just at the back of my head, I'm comparing Chinese literature to American literature. So I'm thinking, who in Chinese history encouraged writers most to go to real life to get material? They are the communists. So well, I think, <laughs> sorry, let me finish my question. Go ahead. Uh, I think, yeah, writers a very luxurious uh, job, a p uh, profession. During Communist China, they, it's a stable job. People get allowance every month or salary, stable salary. They can go out there to the farm, farms or coal mines for three months, half a year to live with the people and to talk to people. I believe those writers were very sincere. They try really hard to and, make and a good your story. Qu your question is? And, uh, but uh, to my opinion, I think this is not the best period of Chinese literature, to put it mildly. Okay, thank you. Well, this, so. is, this is a doctrine called socialist realism. Uh, and if that realism doesn't come out in a certain way, uh, it's not published. Um, that, I think, is a rather large uh, difference. That was the story in the, uh, in, in the Soviet Union uh, also, um, if, I, I hope you're not saying that there was complete freedom of what to write uh, as these people went out into the, uh, the mines and the factories uh, and the um, canal projects. And I don't well, think... I'm, I'm sorry, oh, sorry. We'll, we'll go on to the next question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt. I'd just like to, th to thank you for the talk. It was, it's fascinating. And, um, uh, at a certain point in your talk, you, when you started talking about your new novel... Could you please speak into the microphone? I think I am. Yeah, oh, okay. at a certain point in your talk, when you started talking about your new novel, you went into a different direction. You started talking about moral values. And it's curious, it, my perception of a journalist is one who generally is not so firm on moral values because they see such a wide range of life and so many different people with different values, different cultures, it, that they lose their sense of, of moral certitude they lose the sense that it's necessary for life to get along. And <clears throat> when you mention, you know, the prognosis of Nietzsche, it seems to me that um, you're, you're taking up a new cudgel, that you have somehow a feeling that, what, that your, all your experience is voided by something else. I'm not sure how you came to that conclusion. But in my mind, a very practical counterexample to absolute morality is professional ethics. And you said you didn't think religious values and ethics could somehow be separated, but there are many sets of ethics in professional life. Many professions have their own sets of ethics. And if they didn't adhere to those, uh, institutions wouldn't function and civil society would not evolve and things like Enron. So I want the question. Uh, I want to ask, how do you reconcile this, this aspect of ethics at an operational level in society with the need for the absolute values that you say are disappearing that you're pointing to in your novel. Well, Mr. Wolf, good luck. <laughs> what was that again? No. <laughs> no they, uh, uh, Don't do it. No. No, just to, 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 to quickly uh, answer, the, I am Charlotte Simmons is not a moral uh, lesson. Uh, to me, the great interest in writing is simply to discover. Uh, and I went out to American colleges campuses, universities, all over, literally all over the country, 
to find out what was going on. For one thing, there was this institution of the co-ed dorm in which uh, boys and girls lived together on the same floors across the hall from uh, one another. I think that's, I, th I have a feeling it's, there are such campuses in Sweden, but I don't know of any other uh, country where they, uh, where they exist. And n oddly, no one had ever written about this. And I said, well, let's find out what goes on. And it re reminds me of what Camille Paglia uh, once said. Camille Paglia calls herself a uh, polymorphously perverse lesbian. Um, so she's established a outpost so far to the left that nobody can outflank her. Um, <laughs> and so she's able to say things like, I don't know what got it. She says, I don't know what got into the heads of the feminists. Uh, having uh, young women think that they are the uh, sexual equals uh, of the male, said, you know, if a young woman takes a walk through Testosterone Valley, uh, there are going to be explosions. <laughs> uh, in any case, I was wondering what the explosions would, would be, and uh, the book is full of, to me it's much more interesting to, f to discover what's going on. Uh, and than to give a lesson. That's why also, uh, I keep being called a conservative. I think it's just because I, I make fun of, I often make fun of things that people who think that they are on the cutting edge uh, uh, like so much. Um, I haven't treated all abstract art very nicely over the, <laughs> over the, over the years. Um, and you know that establishes you as a as a conservative. But until somebody can tell me my agenda, what my program is, um, what I see for humanity, um, I'm not paying attention to the label. The lady in black. Thank you. Um, well, since I'm an American journalist working on my first novel, uh, I take a lot of what you said as a real pep talk, and I'm glad we ended up on the same plane today so that I could hear your pep talk here in Amsterdam. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering, um, with the, the discussion that you had of new journalism, um, there's a lot of talk back home about how corporate ownership of newspapers is really killing a lot of quality in reporting. Do you think there's a place for the kinds of great writing and great reporting in a more corporate-owned world of newspapers and journalism? In point of fact, there, there isn't, and you're, you're, you're quite right. Uh, the sad thing that's happened in the United States, and I don't think it's true any, uh, anywhere in Europe, uh, is that the newspaper business has shaken down to a series of local monopolies. There is no national newspaper in the United States, whereas I think in most countries in Europe there are national uh, newspapers. And I know in England there are a lot of, of newspapers that are read nationally. Um, so when these mergers occur and one company, this is a typical pattern, it will buy up both uh, newspapers in a town having already bought up others, finally there are two, uh, and there's no competition whatsoever and there will be just one reporter to cover uh, uh, courts, for example. Why well, have two? Uh, since the same people own uh, both papers. As a result, Less news is covered uh, in the United States today uh, than was covered 75 years ago. Now this has an effect on television because television news is at least 95, in the United States, I don't know about here, at least 95% based on newspaper articles. Whenever television tries to break a story, they get it wrong in, in some big way. They'll have some small country. Well, they got O.J. Simpson, right? How did they get him right? They followed him live. That they can do. Live coverage is, is great. Well, isn't that what moving images are all about? How much live coverage do you see on television? <laughs> uh, they said that television brought the uh, war in Vietnam into our living rooms. I don't think so. I never saw a battle in my living room. The, uh, all I saw was film taken from behind people that had mortar guns. And the, the cameraman back here, he didn't want to get out in the middle of the, the battle. Uh, and you hear this, foomph, foomph. That's the mortar um, going off. 
And then a talking head tells you what took place that day. Um, television doesn't really, it really covers nothing. If there's a, if it can cover something live, it's good, a sporting event. But you have to sort of schedule things for television. Um, it's not very good at uh, what just happens in the, mm -hmm. in the world. One last question, and then my last question, and then Monique Knappa will close our evening. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Mr. Wolf. Um, I'm a Yank myself. I'm from Boston, and I go to a small New England uh, liberal arts college, um, and I lived in a, a co-ed dorm my freshman year. And what and was it like? Well, I, at first I was excited because we shared bathrooms with girls, and I was, like, stoked about it, and then... Just the whole, I mean, it just ended up being gross with the, with the hair and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, <laughs> all that stuff. And I was just like, this isn't cool. And I thought that was kind of immoral. And so it was kind of like a, you know, a crash course, I guess, in, in that. But I, I guess my question is, to, to cut to the chase, um, I, you know, I, I feel guilty. I haven't read your, your, you know, I'm Charlotte Simmons yet, but you went to particularly elite universities Harvard, Princeton, Yale, whatever else, schools. Why in particular those schools rather than a state school? And also, who is to say what is immoral or moral now, considering, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, th those are completely arbitrary terms. I mean, I'm taking a sexuality class now. I'm studying abroad at, at UVA. And you didn't learn enough at college? <laughs> What's that? You didn't learn enough at college already? Uh, evidently not. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. I, I guess, no, we, we, we were having a discussion about pedophilia, and I feel very, very strongly against it, and yet... Okay, can I give the floor to Mr. Wolf, please? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I was liking that. <laughs> um, um, give me a hint about the question. <laughs> uh, um, can you touch upon why the... Say that again. Why the... And not state oh, schools. Oh, oh, oh. No, I did go to state schools. I, I remember, I remember now. No, I did go to state schools. I started off at a private university, Stanford. Um, I wanted to have two components. One, uh, I wanted to create a fictional university that had strong academics and big-time sports. Something else I don't think exists at the college level in Europe. Um, then I went to the University of Michigan. That's a state university. Um, I spent very, the least amount of time at the Ivy League universities. Then I went to the University of North Carolina. That's another state university. I went to the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. It's a huge uh, state university. So I tried. I uh, went to went to both um, on on purpose, just to, so it wouldn't be one-sided. One thing they practically all did have in common, though, was these huge sports. Um, programs um, with rocks for jocks. Yeah, uh, there's these are courses that are tailored for athletes who may not be uh, they're the strongest on campus. They may not be the brightest. So the geology <laughs> class was called rocks for jocks. Uh, A jock is an athlete. The uh, economics yeah. class was called stocks for jocks. Uh, and uh, what was that other one? The uh, um, socks yes, for jocks. There was a third jocks. one. There was a. There, there, yeah. there. Well, read the book, then you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't already, excuse me. Um, Mr. Wolf, my last question. You're 74. 75? 75. When you get really old, you start getting proud of <laughs> each, each year. It becomes an achievement. <laughs> yeah. Well, if your next book takes another 11 years, you might find yourself in a time crunch. I agree. I'm, I, so what's next? Uh, I'm writing a book called The History of uh, the Last 1,000 Years of the World. And it's... In how many installments? No, it's, in, no, it's entitled <clears throat> A Thousand Years in 98 Pages. It was, it was going to be 100 pages, but that sounded too long. <laughs> um, a, hundred, a thousand years and ninety-eight pages, I think, is a is a catchy title. Um, and and I'm not, you know, I'm not kidding about this. So far, there's been absolutely no interest, not even from my publisher. <laughs> but uh, it fascinates me that just a thousand years ago, 
there was only there were only three types of of three status types in the world, no matter where you went, warriors, priests or cler uh, clergymen, um, religious figures, and slaves. There was no such thing as a worker who sells his labor on an open uh, open market, um, and there was no such thing as a leader who has not been a warrior. Uh, there wouldn't be any. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, or there wouldn't be any Tony Blair. Uh, for that matter, there wouldn't have been a, uh, a Ronald Reagan. And what year are you in now? Um, well, this thing is going to go like lightning. Um, and Holland plays a big part in this book, and I, I kid you not. If you go back to the 17th century, you suddenly see that there are two nations that produced the great scientific leaps forward that have led to all of the advances in science right now. And those two are England and Holland. And I won't go into the whole thing, but I think it all goes back to the Reformation and the decline of magic in, in the late 17th century. Now, if that isn't suspense, um, I don't know what is. What is. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Did we get up? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we stay? Thank you. It's after 10, and I hope I didn't offense anybody today that I, we had an interview to do, too. So... Um, thank you so much for entertaining us and for uh, giving us um, a broad picture of um, your wisdom and um, your knowledge. And I think it was a very nice talk and a very nice dialogue here on stage. There was too little time, I'm afraid, but um, still I want to thank you for your questions. There will be some more time to have your book signed, but that's a little bit later. First I want to thank Tracy for your wonderful introduction and your questions. Thank you to our sponsors that are today Prometheus publishing house Prometheus for bringing the Dutch version of the book, but also Van Ditbar, who helped me out tonight for making this evening possible for bringing the English books. The books are for sale just outside this uh, beautiful hall. Um, then Mr. Wolf promised me that he would sign his books, and I think we'll have to reschedule a little bit on the stage, and then you can still sit here, and people, I will direct you how to do that. Um, before I leave you, um, there's one more announcement to make. Next week we have three lectures. I can't believe it myself. There are two in the Amsterdam China series here in Amsterdam. One on the superpowers, maybe the changing of superpowers. I don't know, Mr. Wolf. But we have an evening about America moving, shifting to a new superpower. I mean, China then, with a big question mark. Um, that's on the 12th of, uh, of October in uh, the Rode Hoed. The next night, there are two events, one in Amsterdam with Chinese poets and some poets who left China to go to the States. And there's another evening, our first evening in The Hague, on a new series of the John Adams Institute in The Hague, and we're going to start off with a splash with Jane Fonda, and that's on the 13th of October. And if you are interested, there are still um, forms to fill in to become members, because that makes it easier to get in. Um, that's just outside of the door. For now, thank you very much for all, for all of you for coming here and hope you can stay a little bit longer to have your book signed. Thank you so much. Thank you.